Jackie Bird. She was the one who gave me the bone marrow transplant. Save a life while you can in your lifetime. Enjoying the conference? Very good. <laughs> well, welcome and uh, thank you for being here for this very important discussion on economic security for low and moderate income African Americans. We believe that this is a very timely and very needed discussion and we're very happy that you are all here to take part in it with us as well. On Wednesday, the Congressional Black Caucus, under the leadership of Representative Barbara Lee, who very appropriately just walked in the room, held a very successful summit on poverty reduction, which kicked off this year's annual legislative conference. Were, were any of you able to attend that summit? Excellent, okay. Uh, given the ongoing problem of poverty that so many African Americans are facing, that discussion, of course, was very timely and very, very appropriate. At the same time, we've seen over the past couple of years that middle-income African Americans have also been hit very hard by the economic crisis that's currently facing our country. And from foreclosures to loss of property values to not being able to pay for their children's education to job losses to issues around education in general, access to health care and being able to pay for health care. There are so many dimensions that are affecting the economic security of African Americans that we really thought that we should organize a session that really addresses the issues impacting both low and middle income African Americans. We also recognize that for so many reasons, the lines between low and moderate income for African Americans can get blurred very, very quickly because in fact the distinctions are not as deep as many of us would like to think. And so we thought that was another reason why we wanted to um, expand a little bit on the conversation that had taken place earlier. Our work on economic security here at the foundation is made possible through the very generous support of the Annie e. Casey Foundation and we are very thankful to them for their uh, continued support of our work and for the partnership that we've been able to have with them. So we just wanted to acknowledge Bonnie Howard and her colleagues at the foundation for their ongoing support. We have assembled, if I say so myself, a terrific group of leaders to guide our discussion today. And we really hope that you will find this session informative and enlightening and hope that you will also really participate very actively during the Q&A session, uh, the Q&A portion. We allowed uh, for a lot of time for question and answer. So we really hope that you will be very, very engaged throughout. As a champion of economic and social equity for African Americans, Rep uh, Representative Barbara Lee absolutely wanted to be here to bring you greetings during this session. So please welcome the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Representative Barbara Lee of California. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Innocent, for arranging this very uh, important panel on economic security, especially in the African American community. Thank you and Dr. Scott and the entire Congressional Black Caucus Foundation staff, uh, my staff, and all of you uh, for being here to engage in this very important discussion. Also, I just want to thank our panel of uh, true experts. It's really remarkable to see so many people who uh, have given of their time to be with us today, uh, to share their knowledge and information and experiences, but also uh, especially to our um, Obama administration officials. I just want to say what a difference an election makes. And I tell you, give, give them a round of applause. It's just <laughs> remarkable uh, the type of economic policies that unfortunate that fortunately the president has embarked upon but unfortunately inherited after eight years of disaster as it relates to the bush tax cuts of course the unnecessary wars and all of the other uh, ventures that caused our economy to to tumble and uh, i just have to thank all of the panelists here for your commitment most importantly to turning this around and to making sure that uh, our, our entire country um, rebounds. 
it's difficult. The higher rates now of unemployment we saw, and we talked, and Dr. Inson, thank you for mentioning our summit. We had, and our theme with the Congressional Black Caucus and our agenda is opportunities for all, pathways out of poverty. And we're looking at the opportunities, the economic opportunities that will provide for these pathways out of poverty. Very recently, the Census Department came up with the new numbers on poverty rates. Unfortunately, uh, in 2008, they're soaring. In uh, the African American community, the poverty rates are soaring. They're growing. And the most uh, tragic fact is that the highest percentage of poverty are in families with young children. Uh, there are 8 million more Americans now living in poverty today than there were when uh, George Bush uh, came into office. And we know that the terrible impact of his administration's failed policies really are still being felt. And so uh, today, we, we have to talk about redefining poverty, which we did talk about also a couple of days ago, to truly reflect the reality of what it means to be poor in America and not just some arbitrary model of what was developed uh, in the 1940s. So we talked a little bit about that, and we talked about some of the ways and pathways that could be followed to help people out of poverty. Some are, uh, or include raising the, uh, and indexing the minimum wage, making the recent increases for the earned income tax credit and child tax credits permanent, and increasing uh, the unemployment insurance. We just did another extension of unemployment insurance compensation. Uh, unfortunately, we had to do that because the unemployment rates are still much, much, much too high. Job training, uh, education dollars in our federal budget. We've done a lot of this under the leadership of President Obama, but it's still not enough. Aid money and uh, tax credits alone are never going to truly uh, lift families out of poverty. People need good jobs at livable wages, and they need opportunities to build up some savings and wealth so that they and their families can uh, weather the tough times that every family uh, has. African Americans, on average, have a single dollar for every, uh, a single dime for every dollar of wealth that is held by their white counterparts. A dime for every dollar. And so this is something that is very serious. The unemployment rate in our economy uh, has wreaked havoc on the lives of the entire country, but especially uh, in the African American community. And so in the, economic, in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the Economic Recovery Package, we included about $17 billion uh, to fund a kickstart uh, to transition into uh, a new 21st century green economy that of course will uh, create prosperous and environmentally sound jobs that will provide opportunities for all. Yesterday we had a very uh, successful green roundtable and we're working to make sure that the green job training initiatives uh, lead to qualified individuals who probably historically have not had the requisite skills and have been unemployed, not just as a result of this recent reception, but you know our communities and our people have been unemployed for historically many, many years, and so hopefully we can close some of these gaps uh, and turn this, these lemons into lemonade by trying to help now use some of our tax dollars to uh, train and employ people who have historically been uh, unemployed. And so this uh, panel is extremely important. It's extremely important because we know that we have to understand that economic, our economic security is directly related to our national security. If we're going to be a strong nation, we're not going to be, we can't be a strong nation in the global economy if we don't have economically secure people. We can't be a global world leader if we have people suffering and unemployed disproportionately in the African American community. And finally, uh, it's time, and this is one of the efforts that we're working on, and I have to leave to continue my whipping on the health reform bill. Please, as you have this discussion, please talk about the importance of universal, accessible health care for all. 47 million uninsured in the wealthiest and most powerful country in the world is a moral disgrace. The economic instability that has, caused, has been caused now 
uh, and resulted in the loss of, of health care benefits is just um, unconscionable. And we have an opportunity to turn this around. And so making sure we pass comprehensive health care reform is critical. It's critical to the economic security of each and every man, woman, and child. And it's also critical to our, to our national security. And so please um, be sure to talk about that in, in, the con in that context, because right now we're counting votes. <laughs> we're counting votes. <laughs> and as you go home uh, after this great weekend, please get to your members of Congress and please tell them that you support a robust public option in comprehensive health care reform that is so essential to what we're talking about today. Thank you again very much. Thank all of you for being here and spending your time with us. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for taking the time to come here and to share those words with us. And thank you for everything that you do. When she, the Congresswoman just mentioned the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, it reminded me of something that I did want to share with you. I don't know if you all had a chance to get a copy of this rather valuable document. If you did not, I do apologize. We have actually run out of them. It is a summary of the act very massive and very comprehensive piece of legislation that was actually put together by one of my colleagues at the foundation and I did want to acknowledge her very diligent and extraordinary work in making this happen. She has stepped out of the room. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Alana Hackshaw. So I just wanted to acknowledge her efforts in putting this together. And a number of the members of Congress, including the non-African American members, have actually also asked us if they can have copies of this to share with their, uh, their constituents. And of course, it's an equal opportunity document as far as we're concerned. The goal with this absolutely was to help make this important piece of legislation digestible for everyone so people would get a sense of the scope of what it entailed. So if you didn't get a chance to get a copy, please contact us at the foundation. You can also download it from our website. So you can ac have access to it that way. It's in PDF form. Uh, I believe it was two years ago, in 2007, we had a session focusing on housing issues impacting African Americans. And as I was trying to identify speakers for that session, I came across an organization called the Center for Social Inclusion. I know that I'd heard about it at some point, couldn't remember exactly where, but I got a chance to see a little bit more closely the work that they do and was thoroughly impressed and realize that we're, we're very much like-minded organizations. The head of the organization, uh, founder and uh, the CEO of the organization, Maya Wiley, had agreed to moderate that forum and did an absolutely superb job. This is not just an assessment for me, but actually what I was told by a number of the attendees who were there. And so it was very easy then to ask her to lead this discussion for us. So please welcome Maya Wiley. Thank you very much, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. And I get to, as moderator, have a little bit of a bully pulpit to begin with and to try to frame the conversation that we are going to have today with this very, very distinguished expert panel. And as we heard Representative Lee say, we're really here to talk about poverty, right? And its solutions, more importantly, how we solve this problem. But what is poverty? What is it? I mean, fundamentally, poverty, and I'm, I'm actually quoting uh, a Nobel laureate economist, Amartya Sen, when I say this, is literally our failure to create transactional capabilities for people. And really all that translates into is we have failed to invest in our most precious resource as a nation, which is our people. And why have we done that? I, I once um, was literally, I spend a lot of time trying to avoid television because whenever I watch it, I get very angry and my daughters start yelling at me because they can't hear what's on television. Um, and in one of those moments, I was watching MSNBC and a questioner, when the anchor asked this question of, um, of, of someone who 
happens to be very intelligent, very important thinker in the field, and said, well, you're, you're talking about opportunity. You're talking about building opportunity. And isn't there poverty everywhere? I mean, aren't we always going to have poverty? So can you even name a nation that, doesn't, uh, that has you know, reduced its poverty rates? And unfortunately, the answer to the question came, well, no, we're not saying we can end poverty. And I was astounded <laughs> because the reality is that the United States has, by international standards, 15% poverty rate. Because, of course, by international standards, we're not measuring poverty by income. We're measuring poverty by well-being, by how well people are doing. And by that measure, which, of course, includes income, it includes wealth and assets, but it also includes things like health, safety net, pension fund. The reality is 15% poverty rate in one of the world's richest nations, we can point to nations that have a 6% poverty rate and a 5% poverty rate by the same <coughs> parameters. What that says to us is that it actually is possible to pull down your poverty rates. The difference between us and those countries is investment in our people. When we look at the nations that have significantly lower poverty rates than our own, it often isn't about wealth because we are a wealthy nation. It's about the policy decisions that we make around investing in our people. The other difference is, and there is social science behind what I'm about to say, because we are, of course, here at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, it's about race. It's about race. People of color are not the only poor people in this country. We know that. But when we look at our policy failures to invest in people, race is often at its core. So the social science tells us that in the Scandinavian nations that have significantly lower poverty rates than us, one of the reasons they have a much stronger welfare state, they actually invest in things like child care, they invest in health care, they invest in pension funds, they invest in paid medical leave if you're ill and can't work. Hey, Crystal. Um, they invest in these very important things. Um, and the difference for us is we don't because of race. Those countries are racially homogenous, comparatively speaking. And what will be interesting to see is whether they continue to maintain their commitment to those investments as they have people moving into their countries from other nations making them no longer racially homogenous. So the fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves as a society are, are we willing to invest in our people, which means all of our people, which means looking at the policies that have resulted in a failure to invest in people of color, or have created what we currently see in the healthcare debate today, a conversation of over 47 million people in this country are uninsured, half are people of color, half, half. And if we continue to see an attack on, well, on, on creating a viable health care system that ensures that we all have access to health care, we have to stop seeing images of um, Latinos portrayed as criminals and told that we should not support health care because these people will benefit. That's a conversation about race even when we don't say the words because we see the images being used, people who are not white. So fundamentally, we have to talk about three things. We have to talk about infrastructure. I call them the three I's. We have to talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure means what? We've already been talking about it. Jobs, health care, schools, quality schools, water and sewer systems housing. We have to talk about the investments in those kinds of infrastructures. We have to talk about investments in terms of capital investment. We have also know that in communities of color we are twice as, more than twice as likely to be in the subprime mortgage market. And that is without regard to our ability to pay a prime rate mortgage. In fact, if you are black and earning $350,000 a year, you are more likely to be in the subprime market than if you are white and earning 50. That is not about poverty, that is about race. 
And the other thing we must do is we must have information. How can we decide how to target our investments if we are not collecting data and information that tells us the communities that are most in need? We can't. And what we have to do is make smart investments because we're rich, but our wealth is, has some limits. And so we, we need to make those wise investments in infrastructure that connects people to opportunities and connects the people who are most at need. So we have several policy opportunities to do that. We will probably hear about several. And we also, and some of them we've already heard about, like the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. We have transportation reauthorization. We have health care reform. We have the conversation that there may be a next jobs bill. So we have opportunities, but only if we get active, engaged in the three I's. Infrastructure, investment, and information. So with that, I will now turn it over to James Carr from the Economic Policy, uh, I'm sorry, James is actually the, um, and I've been following James all around DC for the past year, so, um, but from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, a very, very important coalition fighting for exactly some of the infrastructure investments and human capital investments that we've been talking about. So thank you, James. Good afternoon. On behalf of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, I'm honored to be here. And, um, and I think it's most appropriate that I speak first, uh, not because I have anything more compelling or convincing or even more accurate to share with you. Uh, it's because I'll probably depress you. And so you've got a whole <laughs> line of people to try and prop you back up. Uh, because one of the things I've been doing is, uh, and, and as Congresswoman Lee pointed out, it's just amazing, the inherited economic mess that we are dealing with is one that was like a freight train out of control, uh, and it's still out of control. And I think one of the things when we talk about economic security, we really have to understand that uh, we're not secure at all. That that freight train going down is, is really on steroids. And despite all the talk about the, you know, the green shoots and the economy's recovering and on and on and on, um, I can assure you that at least in the near term, uh, any statistics showing an economic recovery is really an oxymoron. And the reason for that is because everyone, even the most optimistic economists, are referring to something called the jobless recovery. And you and I both know there's no such thing as a jobless recovery. And so we know there can be some jobless statistics, but not jobless recoveries. So why is it that, that there's all this talk about a recovery? Well, if you dig down and look to see exactly what's going on, you realize that uh, consumer spending is over 70% of the economy. So the question is, well, are consumers in a position to stage a comeback? And the answer is uh, not at all, right? So we know through the first half of the year we had uh, 3 million, more than 3 million job losses, 3.2 million. Um, poverty was up last year, 2.6 million. And if you look at the first six months of job loss last year, we had about 300,000. The first six months of this year, again, 3 million. That's 10 times as much. So everyone who follows the poverty statistics knows those statistics for this year are going to be dramatically worse, unless something miraculous happens the latter part of this year, which is not expected. So, you know, when you look at the profits, you hear things like, well, the banking system is, uh, is on the men now. Okay, well, how's the banking system on the men? Uh, lending is still down, at least it was by the end of the second quarter. So you have, you have sort of the profits are rising, but the business activity is going down. Well, what's that about? Well, according to the uh, special inspector general that's overseeing the bank bailout, uh, roughly about 23.7 trillion, not billion, trillion dollars of investment loans and guarantees are backstopping the banking industry. And guess what? With all that, we are en route to the largest number of bank failures in American history. Now what's important about that is last year was already the largest number of bank failures in American history. So we're out to beat that again. Uh, so anyone who believes the financial system is turning around and is showing profitability is um, they're just not clear on where those profits are coming from. They're coming from accounting, they're coming from subsidies, they're coming from sailing, uh, selling of major assets. And what about non-financial institutions that are showing uh, improved bottom lines? Well, the quirky thing is there's a connection between that unemployment number and that productivity number. 
You see, you fire enough people, your productivity can improve. And that's exactly what we are having. And so um, we, we, are, we are in a dire position with respect to this economy. It's not improving uh, anytime soon. It's not improving until you hear jobs are being created. And it's important to, to focus on the fact it's not just a matter of people being laid off. It's people being hired. You have to create jobs because the population is increasingly getting larger. So you have to increase them, not just have a, a stable state. Now, one of the reasons that the economy is in the sad state it's in now is because the foreclosure crisis continues, and that's the big thing. A million and a half people through the first half of this year lost their homes to foreclosure. We're expecting at least that many through the second half of this year. It's hard to stage a recovery on the economy when the problem that caused the economy and the financial system to collapse in the first place was a foreclosure crisis, which is still growing. This is a real problem, and one of the big problems for this foreclosure crisis is that it's morphed, it's changed. And so last year and in 07, the big problem were these uh, toxic products, and you've heard a lot about them. Uh, they were reckless and irresponsible, high-cost subprime lending products. The problem that the new administration has now is that unemployment is the major driver of foreclosures. And so in the period of a year ago when we could have restructured these loans for, for people who were facing foreclosure, you can't restructure unemployment. You have to get a person a job, and that is a big, big problem. There are also problems with respect to how servers who are, who are in the front end of the modification process are not participating in a thoughtful way with the administration's making home affordable problem, and that is also a problem. Now, let me just go through a couple of other statistics, and, uh, and then I'm going to conclude because there are lots of other speakers. And I don't want you guys to jump out the window here anyway, uh, because we're on the first floor, so you just get all scratched up. <laughs> but let me just say a, quick, a few things. Um, with respect to downward mobility, even before this crisis occurred within the African-American community, uh, downward mobility was already pretty significant. Uh, unemployment, for example, for blacks has been twice as much as that for whites. So what happens is you just sort of just slide that along. If, if, if it's, uh, if it's uh, you know, 8.5% for non-Hispanic whites, just multiply times two, you're almost there. Unemployment for blacks now is about 15%. For Latinos, is 13%, right, while the national unemployment rate is 9.7%. Um, a Pew Charitable Trust study, I would refer you to it, before this crisis pointed out that living in neighborhoods with high levels of poverty, 20% or more, predisposes children to downward mobility. In fact, 50% likely for downward mobility. What was important about that study was that they looked at between 85 and 2000, almost uh, over half of black children were born, who were born to middle class households actually lived in neighborhoods with poverty levels above 20% compared to 1% for non-Hispanic whites, which means we were already predisposed to downward mobility before this crisis, and now unemployment and poverty are rising. And the statistic that Congresswoman Lee gave about African Americans having very little wealth, we have very little wealth, and a disproportionate share of that is in housing. So as we're on the front end of the foreclosure crisis, we're on the front end of the major source of wealth we have being stripped away. What does that mean for long-term unemployment? It's good that unemployment benefits are being extended because the fact is we have, no real, um, uh, we have no real cushion of savings to rely on for extended periods of unemployment. Um, let me just say a few things about the things that we need to fix because I have exactly one minute. Um, you know that we had an economic recovery bill and I think that's important. But when you look at the amount of wealth that's been lost in this country, $13.9 trillion of wealth, $13.9 trillion, it's hard to see how $787 billion is actually going to compensate for that. The challenge the administration has is that, of course, we have such an extraordinary deficit that they inherited on the day in that there's, a lot of, there's not a lot of sympathy for more spending by a, a significant part of the American population. It creates a real dilemma because do you go ahead and do what you know you need to do, which is spend more money to create more jobs, or do you keep your eye focused on that fiscal responsibility because so much anger and passion is out there about spend, 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 spend. Um, I can say that I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that I'm not in the position who has to 
uh, make those difficult decisions. But I do say that we need more spending, and we need more spending specifically targeted to the neighborhoods that are being most destroyed by this crisis, and those are the financially vulnerable communities that were targeted for subprime lending. Let me just conclude by saying one thing. Within the next 35 years, over half of the U.S. population will be people of color. The idea of being a globally competitive, strong leader in which the fastest share of growth of the U.S. population of the people most marginally connected to the labor markets, to good quality education, to the ability to build wealth, it's just, it's not happening. And so I think one of the arguments we need to make more profoundly is that it's not an option. It's an imperative for us to remain the leading superpower in this world to address the problems of communities of color. Thank you. Now you see why I follow James all over DC. Um, so now we are going to hear from Dr. Algernon Austin from the Economic Policy Institute. Thank you, thank you. Let's see what's doing with the computer. Okay. Um, I just need to click. Wonderful. Moving pretty quickly. Um, I'm used to the old Microsoft, not the new Microsoft. <laughs> Great, great, thank you. Um, before I begin, uh, thank you all for being here. I see there are people standing in the back and people coming in. There are seats on this side and there are seats in there, so feel free to fill in the spaces if you, if you wish. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, green jobs, or green jobs good for African Americans, as uh, Representative Lee mentioned. Um, there has been some movement on green jobs and there um, will probably be some more debates uh, along with the climate bill about making green investments. Uh, so I'm going to look at that, um, you know, what would significant investments in green investments mean for African American workers. Um, I'm using a metric of a good job and I define a good job as a job that has an hourly wage that provides at least 60% of the median household income annually. Um, as you can see, um, in 2008, that was about $14.5 an hour uh, is a good job wage. That's about $4 um, an hour above a poverty level wage and, and significantly higher, even higher above the federal minimum wage. So we're interested Good jobs, if you can have it, get a good job, it's not, you're going to not just be skating above poverty, but you're actually, um, will hopefully be um, a bit, you know, be able to live um, a bit more comfortably than a poverty level wage uh, would, would provide for you. A good job, um, in, in my definition, and this is a very minimal definition, very minimal definition, also provides health insurance and also provides a retirement plan of some sort. Um, here in this slide we see uh, the comparing white and black workers, the rates of workers in good jobs in 1979 and in 2008. Um, what you can see in both sets of bars is that they are declining. We we're experiencing a slow and steady decline in good jobs in this country. And frankly, unless we make this a priority, unless we say we need to do something about this, uh, they will likely continue to decline. Uh, for whites in 1979, about a little over one in three white workers had a good job. Um, in 2008, a little less than one in three had a good job. Uh, for black workers in 79, about one in four, a little more than one in four had a good job. Um, today, about one in five has a good job. So we're seeing 
<clears throat> declines across the board in terms of uh, good jobs. And there was also the discussion of health insurance. One thing, you know, health insurance is part of my definition. One thing that would significantly boost the good jobs rate in the United States is if we had universal health insurance. That would increase the number of good jobs significantly. <clears throat> Another, this is, these slides are just showing African American workers, black workers, 1979 to 2008. Um, what you can notice here, the, the bars on the left are for males. The decline in good jobs have been particularly uh, decline in jobs that males tend to have. So they're de decline in the manufacturing jobs, uh, the unionized manufacturing jobs that we've seen decline steadily since the 1970s. So um, the good jobs declines have been pretty, pretty strong for males, uh, regardless of racial group. Uh, there has been stagnation for women of color for the most part. Black and Hispanic women have either stagnated or declined slightly, um, as we can see here. For white women, there's been a modest increase, but generally across the board, we have a problem um, as a nation in providing good jobs for our workers. So again, it's a, it's a very serious issue. Um, <clears throat> so the, I'm going to show you some estimates in terms of the number and the quality um, and the demographics of the number of, of good jobs that would uh, stem from making a hundred billion dollars in investments in, in the sort of green economies. Um, oops, did I skip something? Okay. Um, once we make the, the previous slide, there, I, I'm skipping some of the technical de um, details, but we do an estimate of what types of jobs are going to be created and what are the characteristics of the jobs. So one thing that we looked at is in terms of the wage distribution in the country, where would these jobs fall? Um, and one thing that's good, you see there's a nice broad distribution. We're not talking about jobs that are just going to be concentrated in the sort of the lowest wage levels, but they're going to be distributed broadly. And in fact, uh, the, um, a majority of the jobs will be at a good jobs wage, they'll be in the top three quintiles in, in the wage distribution. So that's, that's fairly positive. These are jobs that, that are going to be paying fairly decent wages. Um, one question is, will, Af will the typical African American workers be able to get these jobs that are created? Um, another positive thing about green jobs is that the more majority of them, here the green bars represents the the estimated uh, what green workers with green jobs looked in terms of their educational profile. The first two bars uh, from the left are less than high school, high school education, and here you see that um, a slight majority of the, the green jobs actually will not require uh, a college degree. Um, at the far right you see that um, the proportion of black workers with a bachelor's degree in, or higher is actually higher than the proportion of green jobs that we expect will be filled with people with that education level. So what this means overall is that educationally we're, we're fairly, uh, we can be uh, confident that black workers will be able to get these jobs uh, based on the sort of minimal educational distribution. So that's another positive. Uh, one thing to have some concern about is the 40% um, of the, the green jobs are gonna be in the construction industry. African Americans are, have low representation in that industry. Um, note that I said industry, I'm not saying construction jobs, although a fair number will be construction jobs, but within the industry, it can be any number uh, of jobs. So if you're, you know, an administrative assistant working for a construction firm, you're in the construction industry. So it doesn't have to be a construction job per se. Um, but nonetheless, African Americans do have um, 
somewhat l low representation within the construction industry. Um, and overall, what we would get from 100 billion investments in green industries broadly is about three quarters of a million uh, green jobs. Um, about 85,000 of those jobs we estimate would go to black workers. That's about 11% of the total. Um, and black workers make, make up about 11% of the labor force. So we would expect fairly a proportional representation in terms of the, the jobs created. Um, so it's a positive outlook from there. The other positive things about uh, green jobs, about a third are union jobs, and I mentioned what um, part of the decline in good jobs have been in the decline in union jobs that we've seen across the country. Three quarters of the jobs are expected to be male jobs. Um, given the high unemployment rates for black men and given, the, again, the decline in job quality for black men, that turns out to be a po positive from this perspective also. And we also expect a, a small um, increase in wages um, as we make this investment. It's, it's small, it's only a quarter of a percent, but uh, we've also been seeing declining wages um, over time, so that's, that's a positive. Um, in conclusion, uh, green jobs are good jobs for African Americans in that they will increase the number of jobs available for black workers. Uh, most of the green jobs will have good jobs wages. They would allow people to be significantly above the poverty level. Um, and they will, as I mentioned, disproportionately uh, black benefit black males uh, in terms of the share of sort of black jobs will um, about three quarters you would expect to go to black males, and that's also uh, a benefit given the high male unemployment rates. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. And we're now going to hear from Dr. Richard Lemons from the Education Trust. Got a security <laughs> alert. I don't. I don't know if that's about me. Uh -oh. Let's see. Let's cancel this. There we go. Uh, thank you for for inviting me uh, to participate in this important conference along with this distinguished group of panelists. Uh, it was powerful for me to hear the framing that Maya provided because the the notion of these three eyes. I think what I'm going to talk about it really connects to the first eye. It's about infrastructure. And uh, unfortunately, I think um, you're going to need some Prozac after my conversation <laughs> also. Uh, I do have a lot of optimism, but I think I'm going to be sharing some somewhat depressing trends that I think suggest a fundamental crack in the infrastructure of our economy and also of our society that uh, hit disproportionately upon the African American community in the United States. So uh, I want to just kind of kick this off by uh, talking about some trends that underline what's happening in the economy. And I think it's interesting that, that uh, Dr. Austin and I are following each other, connected to one another, because I think you're going to see some, some themes in our presentations but that connect in different ways and come at it at different ways. Uh, first thing that you need to understand that's happening, and it seems somewhat of a no-brainer, but it's a, it's a shifting phenomenon in the United States, is that there's a powerful relationship between educational attainment and income levels and an, and an income gap. Now, there's a lot of conversation about the achievement gap, and that's important. And what we're talking about there, we're talking about test scores. But if we're really serious about changing life outcomes for people in the United States, we have to start talking also about an attainment gap. And what we mean by here is access to college, persisting in college, graduating from college, because moving somebody's math scores in eighth grade will be nice, but it won't dramatically change someone's life like getting them into college, getting them through college, 
and giving them opportunities that can come after college. So let, let me show you this. Uh, these are, we're going to start with patterns that happen to be going across the United States, not broken up by subgroup, and we'll, we'll get to some of the disproportionate patterns uh, a little bit later. So what we have here is, is you see what seems to be a logical progression of income that correlates with the, um, the levels of attainment you reach. So if you have less than high school uh, education, you have less income, and it, it grows dramatically as you get up towards a BA degree. Seems like a, a logical pattern. Uh, this level of income is a very powerful predictor of income for people throughout the United States, which you see in these bar graphs uh, at the bottom. The, the red portions here are folks it, who are now considered low income uh, who buy the de by levels of education that they have. So you notice if you look at the far left bar graph, less than high school, 61% of those people are considered, uh, low in or considered in the low income categories. If you go to the far right, just for an extreme, far number, the number's lower if you have a BA. And also those folks have a much greater access into upper income categories. Uh, this is basically another part of that. Another trend's been going on over the last 24 years, and it's that uh, though there, if you have a BA, the level of income on average you can expect to earn has gone up in real dollars, while other kinds of educational levels have basically hold, held steady and is producing an increasing gap, another form of stratification that's occurring in our economy in the United States. Here's another flip on this gap that's occurring. This is the gap that uh, shows people with high school degrees or GEDs and people with college degrees in this same period of time over the last 24 years, the gap has almost doubled. And what's happening is the high end, the line at the top, if you have, uh, if you have a BA or higher, your income's going up and it's holding tight for everyone else. Basically the same gap if you have uh, some college and versus finishing college, it's close to doubling. Uh, these patterns, though, are having big impact on subpopulations of America. They're landing disproportionately on certain. So I just want to animate this a little bit. Let's talk about uh, the impact upon black men. If you look at the, across this chart, you see uh, young men, black, Hispanic, white, and what happens if they're high school dropout or high school graduate and that gap. So notice that it's not very strong across any of these bars for any of these groups of men. But look what happens to black men. If you do not finish high school, you're locking yourself out of the middle class. And this is a, we're talking about the infrastructure of our society. And given that we know what's happening in a lot of our schools, we have to figure out a way to uh, deal with that. Okay, a employment rate gap for young black men narrows. I'm going to flip past this because I want to make sure that I get to some of the, um, the other patterns that are coming. So we know that educational attainment is critical. Seems obvious. We need to get people into college. We need to get them to persist through college. We need to get them to finish college. Uh, and we've got more and more people going to college, but that's, that hides a kind of ugly truth in there. Uh, notice that across from left to right, African-American, Latino, white students are going to college in higher numbers, yet still we have so, a, a fairly big gap that's occurring in college going. And uh, the gaps are increasing, that the number of uh, white people who are going to college over this time is increasing at a proportion far faster than for Hispanic and African-American students. College completion rates are also a little disturbing. On average, across the United States, we have a 50 3% completion rate of folks who enter into institution or graduate within six years, but the numbers are tougher for Native Americans, African Americans, and Latinos. So we know that minority groups are less likely to graduate from college. So what we have here, and I just want to summarize all this data, is we have a, a increasing relationship, a stronger relationship between the, the levels of education people in the United States are achieving and the income they can expect to have. But it's having a bigger impact 
upon African Americans in the United States and on Latinos. And what it leads us to know, because we have lots of schools in the, uh, in the United States that are poorly serving African Americans, poorly serving Latinos, and we have to figure out how to solve that. And the optimistic part for me is there's a huge window of opportunity. I had another slide here that at least lift us up a little bit, a little smidging of, of Prozac for us. There's a big window of opportunity here because people are starting to talk about the dropout factories that some of our high schools are, especially in our urban centers. We have a lot of attention on the Hill right now and on a number of people in all from the full political spectrum who are focused on how do we change the conversation from just achievement to attainment? How do we met, make the incentives so that colleges don't just allow people in the door, but they hold on to them once they get there? Um, it's kind of scandalous, and I'll leave you with this, that if we have a, we have a much larger um, uh, dropout problem in college than we do in high school, and it's the one in high school that we're spending a lot of time talking about. So I look forward to talking a little bit more about some of the solutions that we can look forward to making a difference in this, these patterns. Okay, thank you. I just want to thank my panelists for really staying on time. I'm really trying to make sure we do because I know that you all are having a lot of questions and comments that we want to make sure we have time to get to. Um, so I would like to invite Gina Wood, Deputy Director from the Joint Center's Health Policy Institute. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, that's better, that's better, because it seems as though, I don't know if you've noticed, but outside of my colleague here, Maya, I'm the only woman on this panel. And as you can see, these men have brought such dreaded conversation here. So I think it's my task now is we're going to be transitioning to the administration, and we know we have a very fired up president, that uh, it's going to be important that I try to bring a little bit of change and voice of reason and hope to the discussion, all okay? Right now, all right now. So I think he often says, what is it, fired up? Ready to go. Ready to go, fired up? Ready to go. I know it's hard on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> but I am truly delighted to be here uh, today with you to share some of the work of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, particularly on the impact of health and health care on the economic security of African Americans. And I especially want to, I'm sorry, I can stand back, okay. I especially want to thank um, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, my good friend, Dr. Innocent and Dr. Scott, um, as well as being able to be here with this distinguished panel. Uh, but I also would like to acknowledge um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who we heard from earlier. She has been just an incredible, incredible leader for the Congressional Black Caucus this past year and continues to really lead the forefront in that. And so I'm just really delighted to have this opportunity to be here. What I'd like to do is really outline for you some major findings of the Joint Center. We recently released a study, and I brought copies of it outside. It's called The Economic Burden of Health Inequalities in the United States that I would urge you to get a copy of. And you can also get a copy of this on our website site at www.jointcenter.org um, because it's really, I think, one of the first studies that's been done like this in some time or if ever that really looks at the economic burden of health inequalities in the United States. We released this report actually just last week um, at a health reform briefing at the National Press Club, and we were very honored to have um, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services join us um, as, one of, as well as our distinguished researchers um, for that. This report um, used data from existing federal health surveys, um, and the study found that between 2003 and 2006, health inequalities for U.S. people of col color cost more than an extra $50 billion a year. Now, these, in, these direct medical costs over the four-year period of the study amounted to a total of $229.4 billion. Now, please keep in mind that this price tag of $230 billion incurred between 2003 and 2006 reflects only the excess costs associated with health inequalities. So when you think about the cost of health, that number, $230 billion, is the excess cost that we have to pay if we don't eradicate health inequalities. For African Americans alone, the direct medical expenditures due to health inequalities over the four-year period was $135.9 billion. Thus, eliminating health inequalities for African Americans and other people of color is not only the just and moral thing to do, it is the most cost-effective thing to do to help restore the nation's financial health 
situation. Now let me say a few words about the indirect cost and the results uh, from the health inequalities. These include indirect cost of illness such as lost productivity, lost wages, absenteeism, use of family leave for avoidable illnesses, and lower quality life as well. The indirect cost of premature deaths, which are foregone wages, lost tax revenues, benefits and services for families of the deceased, and lower quality of life for family survivors. The researchers calculated that the indirect costs that result from health inequalities add up to more than a trillion dollars, again, between that 2003-2006 time period. So when you add the direct and the indirect cost of health inequalities together, the grand total is really a startling $1.24 trillion. The study noted that this figure of $1.24 trillion over the four-year period is more than the annual gross domestic product, or GDP, of India. And this is the world's 12th largest economy. So who is paying this $1.24 trillion? Uh, well, all of us are paying for it in our federal, state, and local tax bills, as well as in the consumer cost from bills for doctor's visits, prescription drugs, and medical procedures. So yet eliminating racial health inequalities will do more than put the nation's fiscal house in order. It will also improve the health status and outcome for people of color from cradle to grave. And that in turn will improve economic security among African Americans. So allow me to use a metaphor of a coin when speaking about the relationship between economic security and health outcomes. On one side of the coin, you will have the relationship between an individual's economic security and access to quality health services. The implications of this side of the coin is a relationship between economic security and subsequent health outcomes, and this has been very well uh, documented. Access to health care includes both access to health insurance coverage and access to the providers and the facilities that render these services. For low-income African Americans, those living in poverty, some 40% were covered by Medicaid in 2003. And that same year, 17% of elderly or disabled African Americans were covered under Medicare. So however, even when people of color, color have health care coverage in public, and that means Medicaid and Medicare, those are public programs, public programs, or private insurance programs, disproportionately report difficulties in accessing health care services. So they still have difficulty in having access to services. In 2004, more than a third of African American women reported that they held off visiting a doctor because of the cost. And that's really a crime. Even after adjusting for age, insurance, and income, African Americans and other people of color are less likely to have a usual source of health care, also known as medical home. In summary, African Americans and other people of color are disproportionately more likely to lack coverage, delay, or forego care and face medical debt. And one of the things I think you want to know is, is that the number one reason for bankruptcy in this country is health care. So remember that, um, that statistic. On the flip side of the coin, health status and health care are also inextricably linked to subsequent economic security, especially for African Americans. Negative health events directly affect a working age adult's ability to remain in the workforce, which in turn helps determine asset building opportunities and wealth trajectories. Yet fairly supported research on improving health and health care for African Americans is unfortunately fairly recent. 17 years ago in 1992, the Joint Center published what was at the time a pioneering document entitled A Health Assessment of Black Americans. And although it is hard to believe that it was not until 19 85 that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services published an official report on black and minority health. The Office of Minority Health was actually established just following that year, 1986. And then moreover, the National Institute of Health did not adopt a policy, think about this, did not adopt a policy that urged the inclusion of people of color and women in its clinical health research trials until two years later in 1987. Three years later after that, they established the Office of Research on Women's Health. So not only for people of color, but even for women in general, uh, we're way behind the curve. Yet Congress still did not mandate the inclusion of women and people of color in any NIH-supported clinical research studies until 1993. So how can we really know, you know, what we need to do to make sure that we're well? So I just, you know, really want to kind of close in saying that enactment of a comprehensive health reform legislation is absolutely imperative. If we are to eliminate the current health inequities facing African Americans and other people of color, 
The results of these inequities are now well documented in higher premature death and disease rates among African Americans. It was interesting when Secretary Sebelius joined us last week, she called the higher rates of premature deaths and diseases among African Americans, and I quote, quite stunning and shocking. She further emphasized that although we have become better at measuring these inequities, we have made little progress in reducing them. She also pledged her personal commitment, as well as the President's commitment, to eliminating such health inequalities. So these inequities include serious and significant financial barriers that prevent access to quality health care services from time-sensitive treatment options to preventative care, aimed at curbing a wide range of chronic and debilitating illnesses. So clearly reducing these health disparities and enacting comprehensive health care reform is a top priority of the President, the Secretary, as I mentioned, but also for the Congressional Black Caucus and the Tri Caucus as well. So now it's really time for Congress uh, to send the President a health reform bill, which he can sign. At last week's health reform briefing at the National Press Club, the Joint Center also released a document entitled Congressional Health Care Reform Proposals, Potentials for Advancing Health Equity in America. And I have copies of that outside. So as I think um, Congresswoman Lee had said, we need you to go out, in addition to their efforts, to go out and talk to the members of Congress, and you can use that analysis to really make the case of the importance of why we need universal health care today. Thank you. So now you've heard from all of those who do not work for government. So now we get to hear from those who do work for government. And we're going to start with David Henson, who's from the Minority Business Development Agency. Thank you very much. Certainly I want to thank Congresswoman Barbara Lee for uh, hosting this very important panel. The Minority Business Development Agency is the only agency in the federal government who's tasked to stimulate the growth and competitiveness of minority businesses in, in America. And because we're going to frame this, because this has been framed in terms of poverty, I'll, I'll make my comments in that context. Essentially what we do is we bridge the gap between the government's commitment and responsibility to business in a capitalistic system and the individual decision by U.S. citizens. And that decision that the people we work with have made is, is that poverty is untenable, unacceptable, uh, and they're not going to have it. And in America, the, way you, the biggest way to move out of that state, the biggest way to create wealth, is through private business ownership. Um, private business ownership has been the source of wealth for every community who has set foot in this country. And we focus on those individuals who have decided that wealth is within their sphere, that poverty is an untenable state, and that they're not going to have it. Let me give you some statistics. The United States uh, African American population represents about 12.1% of the total population. Okay, 12.1% of the total population. African, African American businesses represent 1% of the gross receipts within our economy. What's more telling is, is that every African American man, woman, and child generates somewhere around $10,000 of income. The average black family has an, of four has a net worth of less than $9,000 of income. $9,000 of wealth, I'm sorry. And so what's the difference between a wealth, uh, an income generation of let's say $40,000 and a wealth base of $9,000. The difference is spending, and spending is a choice. The people we work with in our centers around the country, and MBDA has 46 centers around the country, what they've chosen to do is to take their capital and reapply that capital into productive entities, businesses, and so they hire people. And each individual has a choice to either be an employee, and there's nothing wrong with being an employee, or they can be an employer. The beautiful thing about America and the beautiful thing about having President Obama uh, here as our president, 
uh, having Secretary of Locke, who's an Asian American, as Secretary of Commerce, having Dennis Hightower, who's an African American, former president of Disney, as a Deputy Secretary of Commerce is, is that the people are in place and the psychology in, is in place and the leadership is in place to ensure that if you choose to be an employer, the opportunity is here and now. Uh, before I came, joined government, I ran a company. And so my perspective will be a little bit different than some of my esteemed colleagues. I don't look at this economic downturn as that, as a, a worst case scenario. I look at it as an opportunity. People in the business community look at it as an opportunity because now if you're interested in buying a company, you can buy a company at a lower valuation. Well, how do you buy a company? MBDA is here to help you understand how to buy that company. What we're focusing on now is trying to help African-American citizens, African-American business people think about buying companies as opposed to building companies. Because when we talk about banking and, and lack of capital, there's not a lot of capital for building cash flow. There's a ton of capital for buying cash flow. There's a ton of capital available if you have a joint venture or a strategic partnership. And that's what we're here to do. Let me give you some more numbers since I am a little, I'm at a little bit of a statistical limitation. I don't have a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> but let me give you an example of what we've done at MBDA. Last year, we generated $2 billion of contracts and financings for minority businesses nationwide. And just to give you who we service, we service the African American community, the Asian community, Hispanic community, the Hasidic Jewish community, the Native American community, Native Alaskan community, Hawaiian Native community, uh, and, and, and those are the groups that we service nationwide. So we generated $2 billion of contracts and financings for minority businesses nationwide. Those contracts and financings represent an, an ROI, which is how we look at our business, of 74 times. So for every taxpayer dollar, for every one of your dollars that flew into MB, flowed into MBDA, we generated $74 of economic output. And that's how we look at the world. The reason I tell you that is because the opportunity for you to create wealth is available. And, and now's the time. Despite all the problems that our community has, and we all know about them. Uh, we all sit around the table with our parents and grandparents, hopefully, and we've talked about these things. You know, I've talked about these things since I was a kid. The one thing I can promise you, and I've lived in several different countries, there's no better place if you are in a state of poverty to move out of poverty than the United States of America. There's no better time to do that than now because, again, we had the leadership in place to make that happen. We have it on the Congressional Black Caucus. We have it in the, in the White House. But fundamentally, it's your decision. Fundamentally, it's our decision. And the government is here to help, but what the government cannot do is they cannot make you decide that poverty is an untenable state and that it's an unacceptable environment for you to live in. You have to decide that. I have to decide that. We have to decide that. And if we make that decision, then all the economic opportunity that has been spoken of since you know, we were kids becomes available to us. And MBDA is here to help you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will now hear from Damon Munches from the US Treasury Department. Probably the first time anybody from the Treasury Department got a hand. <laughs> probably the last. I mean, probably will be, right? <laughs> you're right. So you set yourself up for that. No, 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 no. You're exactly right. Uh, but fired up and ready to go. Seriously. Um, I want to talk about something that's very fundamental to everyone, and it's not only people who are in poverty, but it's also middle class family, and it's, and it's people who own homes, it's people who have credit cards, it's people who have checking accounts, it's people who have 401ks. Consumer financial protection. This administration recognized when we took office that what took place in the fall of 2008 cannot happen again. Our financial system was on the brink of cataclysmic failure. I worked on Wall Street 
And I remember seeing markets that were formerly liquid and that were working dry up and go away. I don't think people remember, but there was a time in the month of October last year when you didn't know if when you put your card into the ATM, you were going to get money out. Remember that? Remember all those times when people said, you may not have a checking account, your savings may be gone, your 401k, your retirement plan, credit card fees going up, subprime mortgages changing on you. We're not going to do that anymore. We've had enough of it. And the president's made a commitment. One of his key legislative agendas while he's in office, he's got three things he's given us to do within the first period of, for, during this first term. Health care, and you've heard some about that. Climate change, you haven't heard much about that today. And financial regulatory reform. This is something that the media doesn't talk about enough, but it is critical to the lives of all of us. I'm a lawyer by trade, and I was an investment banker for 10 years. I remember the time when I bought my first house. I almost cried because I couldn't understand the documentation that I had to sign. And I was trained. <laughs> I did high finance. I was a lawyer. I couldn't understand the documentation. Have you ever read the fine print that you get in the mail on your credit card bills? Have you ever really read it? The right to jack up fees on you at their own whim? How many of you have been paying your balance off month by month thinking that you're doing the right thing all of a sudden you get your interest rate and it's 22%? What? What happened? I'm paying my bills on time. These types of things have been going on for years. Okay? Financial services companies figured that if they could find people who are uneducated, didn't know their rights, and were vulnerable, who does that sound like? Right, exactly. They were going to take advantage of you. They see the uneducated, the people who don't know their rights, the people who don't understand the fine print as sources of profit. You are pigeons waiting to be fleeced. And that's what you've been. Well, we're not going to let them do it anymore. We passed a credit card bill recently that is going to stop some of the abusive fees. It's going to stop some of the fine print, make them explain to you in plain language what the credit cards are going to do. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten credit card offers. You know, you get that thing in the mail that says, don't bend, don't fold. It looks like it's some sort of official document from the government, and really it's like an offer to get another credit card. No more of that. We're going to put a stop to all that. In August, we sent... That too. That too. Exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, let me get to my point. Thank you. Well, let me get to my point because I don't have a lot of time, but I really, and, 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 we need your, and we need your support. In August, we submitted a 13 title package of legislation to Congress, 713 pages of legislation for financial regulatory reform. It covers everything from de derivatives, you've heard about them, to resolution authority, which is going to be so that we don't have to have a TARP. We don't have to have $700 billion to bail out all these banks, because we hated to do it. We didn't want to do it, but we had to do it. And most importantly to us, a consumer financial protection agency, finally. There will be one agency that is devoted to protecting consumers from the financial predators that have been taking advantage of us for so long. You hear a lot of criticisms in the media. They say, well, gee, you know, the FDIC has a piece that regulates consumers, and they do, and they do a fine job. The Fed has a piece that regulates consumers, and they do, and they do a fine job. But this is so important, we need one place to go that's going to protect you. All the myriad financial products, you remember good times when they talk about easy credit ripoffs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you, that's what's been going on for years. Well, we're going to end it. The president is committed to this. We're not going to have it anymore. <coughs> We're going to try to simplify mortgages. This Consumer Financial Protection Agency is going to try to put all these financial intermediaries under one level playing field. So, you know, when you go in some neighborhoods and people don't use the regular bank, they go to the payday lender, the check cashing shop, right? 
the finance company, all those people. Again, pigeons waiting to be fleeced. The, the margin, the profit margins on some of these companies is outrageous. The interest that they charge you is crazy. They had a word for it in the Bible, but I won't go into it. <laughs> We're going to end all that. This Consumer Financial Protection Agency is going to put all these events on the same, all these companies and all these businesses on the same level playing field. It's going to regulate them all. It's going to treat, for the first time, all these non-bank financial intermediaries that used to prey on you the same way that it treats other banks. We're going to end abusive credit card practices. We're going to try to protect your retirement security. And we're going to also try to stop all that junk mail that you get in the mail. We're working on that, but that's going to be difficult. <laughs> But I want to thank you all. Uh, and I, I really will want to encourage you to contact your members of Congress. I want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for having us here. Jim Carr gave a great presentation about what's wrong. We're trying to make things right. So thank you. Thank you. And last but definitely not least um, is Lee Bowman, who's from the FDIC. And immediately following that, I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions of uh, the panelists just to get us started. And then we are going to ask people to line up behind the microphone to ask questions or make comments. And I will quickly warn you that my job is to make sure that you don't get to give a speech. <laughs> so think about what your question or comment is and make it short. Mr. Bowman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for your patience and your, your diligence and your focus as uh, each of my uh, colleagues have uh, presented from various perspectives. I'm going to be very brief because I know we're all eager to hear from you and, and get a interactive dialogue going. Before we do, I would like to add just a, a little bit of context and a little bit about what FDIC is doing to sort of help frame that discussion, that interaction. I think most of you are probably familiar with FDIC, but for those that are not, um, our primary, what, what that acronym stands for is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And our primary mission is to ensure the stability and public confidence in the uh, nation's banking system. And as you can imagine, uh, during these last couple of years, that's been a yeoman's task. <laughs> but I'll remind you, and as Jim Carr reminded us as in his opening remarks, the the recession that we have just been through, or going through, is the worst that we've seen since the Great Depression. And it was the Great Depression that was the impetus for the formulation of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And so one of the good things in this whole thing is that we're not seeing the same kind of run on the banks that we did during the Great Depression, which just made things even worse. What you're finding is, or what we're finding is that, yes, as Jim mentioned, um, banks have failed at an alarming rate. And in 2010, unfortunately, that rate is expected to continue. But what we're not finding this time around is that folks are not running on the bank to remove their money and put it under mattresses. There does seem to be a confidence in the US banking system and a confidence that we will get through this. Yes, this is the toughest time we've, most of us have seen in our lifetimes, but we will get through this. Part of the role that we play is insuring your deposits, up to $250,000 per individual per account. So there are ways to make that coverage go up well above a million dollars of your money in the bank. And I think folks are, sort of understand that and have not felt the need, by and large, to run and take their money out. Since the Great Depression and since the formulation of FDIC, no one has ever lost a penny of their money that was in a financially ins uh, federally insured financial institution, and no one ever will. The challenge is that a lot of people don't know that, and they have their money all kinds of other places <laughs> and are losing it left and right, or have lost it left and right. So you may know about the, Fed, the uh, insurance on your money. You may know that we examine financial institutions for safety and soundness, and you see a lot of them dropping by the wayside. So clearly, there's work to be done there. What you may not know about the work that we do 
is our efforts to work with banks to help them leverage, to do more lending, to do more investing, to provide more services in the communities that they purport to serve. And we do a whole host of creative things in that regard that you may not be as familiar with. I wanted to frame some of those for you, and my goal in the next couple of few minutes is to put some information out there that might pique your curiosity and may want to have you follow up and work with us on some things. And I hear, as I've heard of my colleagues speak, I, I can hear some synergies where we might be able to work together. I'm eager to get to that part of the discussion. I know for myself, as, we've, as I've gone through these economic times, oftentimes I've just felt helpless. And I know that you, some of you probably have too. It's like you, you hope they get it together. You hope they solve this problem. You feel as though, well, I feel as though I didn't make it, but it's certainly upon me. You didn't make it, but it's certainly upon you. And if you're like me, you've asked yourself time and time again, well, what can I do? How can I fix this? What should I be doing now? And I'd like to throw out a couple of things that we're doing that I hope you might be interested in being involved in. Um, one, we have an initiative called our Alliance for Economic Inclusion. And that is really designed to take the information out to, to folks who need it most, African American, Asian, Hispanic, underserved communities who need it most so that they won't be victims of these predatory practices. They won't get into that cycle with the check cashers or with the payday lenders. Those who have gone to, to get mortgages and will go to get mortgages in the future will understand the difference between a prime mortgage and a subprime mortgage and be able to, to navigate better. Our economic inclusion initiative basically is, is focused on specific markets around the country where we pull together collaboratives, coalitions of local industry players that make up lenders, uh, credit unions, uh, foundations, city government, state government, counseling agencies, anyone who's interested in these issues to work on what are the challenges in this market? What's going on in this market? Why are people being underserved here? and begin to craft local solutions to deal with that. Maybe, maybe those solutions are new products. Maybe it's outreach. Um, and we work on specific local market focuses. I'll be glad to talk with you more about that as we get into the dialogue. Um, also, we have a financial education tool that we can make available to you, for those of you who are doing counseling, who are working, um, who have advocacy organizations, who are working in your churches or your faith-based organizations that you can use to provide folks with up-to-date information around how to manage your money better, how to um, invest better, how to uh, repair your credit if that's needed, how to shop for a mortgage, um, a whole host of financial issues. We're also doing an initiative with the black colleges, so I'm glad my sister raised the issue about the, the kids on campus getting credit card offers and don't even have a job yet. We hear you, and we're going to historically black colleges. We've just announced a partnership back in June with the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges to take this information on campus, be there right with the credit card companies at freshman orientation, build this stuff into the business school curriculum, make this stuff available broadly before our kids even get into that problem. There's a whole host of stuff that I could share with you. I know I'm, my time is short. We want to get to the, to the point where you can, we can talk with you, and so I'll leave it there, but I look forward to sharing more with you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to start opening it up with a few questions, but I do want to ask people to start lining up so we can get your questions and comments. Um, and I, I wanted to start, you know, because our distinguished members from the administration had to wait so long <laughs> uh, to share their information, and there's so much that is so important that the administration is doing, and you've shared some of it. Um, let me ask, because both of you made statements uh, that suggested obviously a lot of things that we at individual level can do if we have more information and can make better decisions. We also know that a, one of the huge problems for our communities is that we don't have competitive mortgage markets. We don't have competitive access to credit. People aren't fighting to serve us, so it's not just as if we have information, we'll necessarily be able to find lenders who will give us prime rate loans. I mean, we know that a lot of irrational decisions have been made in terms of when our businesses get access to credit or when homeowners um, get access to affordable mortgages. What can you tell us about the administration's strategies about increasing access to credit in our communities? 
I'll be glad to take the. Um, I want to refer again to when I was talking about that Consumer Financial Protection Agency. One of the things that has taken place over the past 25 to 30 years in most underserved communities where we do live uh, are that community banks uh, struggled for years and years and years, uh, primarily because larger banks and non-bank institutions competed with them to offer mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, easy credit ripoffs, and they struggled, and they struggled. We hope that through our regulation of some of these non-bank financial institutions, community banks will begin to thrive again. And we believe that community banks are going to be some of the key anchors and sources of access to credit in a lot of the underserved communities. Um, I can't tell you how much good work community bankers do in this country. Uh, and we look forward to applying this new regulation framework and hopefully helping lighten the burden, regulating some of their com unfair competition so that they can increase the access to credit for people in those communities. Okay. Lee Bowman and then James Carr. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, we wholeheartedly support the work of community banks and uh, regional banks. Um, and particularly minority institutions. Uh, at FDIC, we have a, a special initiative where we pay very close attention to minority-owned institutions because our institutions really were the ones who um, initially provided credit to our communities, and they're the ones who are suffering the most now. And um, so I think one of the things that we can do as a, as a people are to support our own institutions. Uh, in addition, um, we are doing some initiatives that are designed to, from a policy standpoint, designed to encourage larger financial institutions to invest in minority and community banks uh, because they are the experts on the ground. They know how to underwrite the products. They know the people. They know the customers. Oftentimes, they don't have the access to the capital that they need that they can then put out on the street. So we try to do everything that we can to support their growth um, and enhancement. Um, in addition, um, we're also looking to, we think another way that we can get capital into our communities um, and increase access to credit is get better at micro-lending. There are a number of, of uh, new businesses, growing businesses, um, that don't need $250,000 to get started or to expand, don't need a million dollars. They need 20000 25000 and so oftentimes we bring in the expertise of some of the micro lenders and again and get, get the larger institutions to invest in the experts at making micro loans to get that capital to those businesses who would struggle to qualify for uh, your typical SBA financing. Okay, thank you. James. Sure. The single most important law that deals with markets and particularly low and moderate income minority markets is a law called the Community Reinvestment Act. And a lot of you have probably heard about it because the right attacked that law saying that it was responsible for the meltdown of the markets. In fact, according to the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve Board, not a nonprofit, 6%, only 6% of the high cost loans that were responsible for this foreclosure crisis were covered under CRA. Turn that around and say 95% were un-CRA regulated institutions. That law needs to be strengthened and it needs to be moved over to the new Consumer Protection Agency as a regulator. Now, what the President did was exactly that. They moved it over and proposed expansion of that law. The House took it out. The justification is that that agency is about individual products to individual people and it gets confused with community. Well, here's the bottom line. Not since Plessy v. Ferguson in the 1800s have products been delivered to black and Latino communities at an individual level. The whole point in forced segregation was to create the markets that you could then exploit without exploiting your own people. And so we must insist that the House put the Community Reinvestment Act exactly back to that Consumer Financial Protection Agency exactly the way the President proposed because if that law gets passed, Ultimately, what we'll end up with is marginally better designed subprime loans, marginally better designed payday loans, still polluting and littering communities of color without any enhancement in the market itself. We need to insist that that law be included in that agency. Okay, we've got a couple of specific actions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I want to piggyback on that in just a second and say they also, when Congress 
revised what the president sent in, took out plain vanilla loans, which mm -hmm. is we, want, we don't want special products. We want access to the products that we qualify for. 50% of the people who got subprime mortgages qualified for prime mortgages but did not have access to the product. The president said everybody who offers a mortgage has to offer a plain 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Congress has taken it out, and I have to say this, our members on the Financial Services Committee need to hear from us that they have to protect us mm -hmm. on that issue. Then I want to talk to the FDIC about what you can do right now to protect the, the thousand, millions of African American homeowners who are suffering through foreclosure. Right now, you're doing purchasing and acquisition agreements where you're guaranteeing 80% of the losses if they should come from the bank that buys these, these institutions. But you're not requiring them to participate in modifying loans. Mm -hmm. If we're going to guarantee 80% of their losses, the least they could do is modify loans and allow people to remain in their homes. That's something you can do today. Thank you. Yes, you can respond. That is an excellent point. That is an excellent point, and we are working on that. What we do typically when a bank fails and the FDIC ends up taking it over is to quickly try to liquidate that bank, sell it to um, a larger bank or another entity who can run it. Oftentimes, we have to actually run the bank ourselves for a while while looking for that sale. Two things that we've, that we've done to try to get at that. One is while we're running it, we require that to be modified by the, under the underwriting terms and in the sequential order of consideration that our chairman, Sheila Baer, had suggested a year and a half ago, which, essentially, which right now actually is the, is the, the prototype or, or, or mirrors the president's uh, Making Home Affordable program and the provisions for loan modification and refinance. It's, it's essentially that program. So while we have the bank under our control, that is exactly what we do. To my knowledge, most of the time when we go to sell that bank, that's a part of the negotiation. But what we do is we look at um, the least cost to the taxpayer, how, to, how that bank can be sold most quickly at least cost to the taxpayer. And oftentimes that provision to force them to modify um, would hold the deal up or make it more expensive and we have to sort of give that one up. But we will stick with that one. Well, we're not because it costs you more if we, if we sell it to someone else or don't sell it at that particular price. But we hear you loud and clear. We are continuing to, to push for those modifications and we are continuing to force it to be done while we control the bank and to the extent that we can negotiate that in the sale, we do that as well. Hi, thank you all for coming and talking to us today. My name is Andrea Wilson, and I am originally from Chicago, Illinois. I just relocated here to Washington, D.C. in October. Um, as I recently finished graduate school, I have six figures in school loans. I'm a single parent of a seven-year-old little boy, and I am perplexed at the thought of building wealth, paying these school loans off alone, as well as ensuring a solid future for my son. So I just really need some practical practical advice on where to start, where to start, the resources available, and just, you know, what I could be doing right now. As I finish education, my education, I have my PhD, but I need to pay these school loans off and I need to, you know, provide for my son. Well, and congratulations on your PhD. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, indeed. Do we have any advice from the panelists? Yeah, I can offer for a, a, a couple of items. I'm sure my, my colleagues can pr perhaps offer alternative advice or even better advice. But um, one, there, there are a host of uh, financial advisors out there, and certainly at the PhD level and the, and the kinds of income you'll be generating, I, I'd suggest you might want to talk with one of them who can custom tailor a plan for you. And in most cases, um, the plan will involve um, uh, a strategy to pay off that debt and then begin to accumulate assets and invest in, but they'll tailor it specifically to you. 
Um, there are also uh, several nonprofit housing, uh, not, not necessarily housing counseling, but several nonprofit uh, financial counseling agencies who can also assist with that. And uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, pr provide you with referrals to those who are closest to you, depending on where you live. I say check, check your credit record every four months because one of the hidden secrets about financial ability in this country is your credit score. Frequently there are things that are wrong, they're inaccurate, uh, they're untrue, they're false on your credit report, and this can harm you for years and years and years and your own access to credit. Be vigilant, look at it on a regular basis, uh, and try to make sure that all the information on it is true. Can, I'm actually going to ask Mr. Lemons just to drum, jump in here on one point because part of what you were telling us was the incredible importance of getting a, uh, uh, access to and finishing higher education and we've actually just heard a story of someone who has done that um, and faces extreme affordability issues but we also know that affordability may be one of the issues that people are facing and failing to complete. So can you share with us some of the solutions? I wish I had solutions because I'm in the same ballpark. I, I, I think I owe about $80,000 to the federal government. Any help down there? I owe about that much. I think that I, I can, I'll say at a general level, and it, it, it won't feel um, particularly useful right now, is that. Uh, we know kind of from the economics of this that uh, the, the world's your oyster right now. I mean, it, it's going to take a little while, but the, the opportunities that when you've, you've opened so many doors with that kind of education are, are kind of amazing. And I think that the, the wise counsel to get really smart, sophisticated advice and knowledge about how to navigate that because as someone who did not come from any wealth, who came from uh, less, you know, the highest level of education in my system, I'm ignorant about uh, financial decisions because I never had money. My parents never had money and so I, I, I shock you with the awful decisions I've made with my own capital. So I'll, I'll stay back from giving you too many suggestions on your own. But I, I think there's, um, there's legislation that's being worked up right now that's about uh, changing the rules on uh, getting student loans which I think is important, won't help this particular issue, but it's about uh, making sure that these, these loans are guaranteed at, by the feds and that they're stable and that they'll still be there if you get into college and you get access to loans that are gonna enable you to afford it, they won't go away a year later and that uh, you'll still have that opportunity to complete the degree. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, um, I wanted to know about the educational gap and the economic gap. Um, do you believe there is a better way to be teaching that could target minorities that could be implemented into all schools and that would just make everything better? We've got a week, we can start talking. I mean, this is a, um, before being at the Education Trust, I spent the majority of my time uh, working with districts and schools on how do you think about systematically transforming the system. The, the, the problem is, is that we're trying to do marginal shifts on a fundamentally broken structure. And let's, let's not pretend that it's the opposite. We have a system in place right now that's gamed against African Americans. We have a system that is very good at something. It's very good at sorting people. And it, uh, I, I tell you a story because it, it, it's one that I've, I've kind of lived through. Uh, I, I grew up in Wake County, North Carolina, which was you know, still kind of heralded for its integration and went in grade school and probably 20% of every classroom I was in was African American. There were no Latinos at the time in any of my schools. There were very few Native Americans. It was black and white. Uh, by middle school, the tracking started to happen, maybe 5% African Americans in my class. By the time I was a freshman, there was Charles in any of my classes in a school that had 25% African American. 
I don't know if Charles ever made it because I don't remember Charles walking across and getting a diploma. So it, this doesn't get to the answer there, but I think we have, to, we have to know that we have a fundamental break in the infrastructure. What we do know now is that quality teachers, number one variable to affect student achievement. We also know that students of color and students of poverty, pardon my language here, are getting screwed in terms of the quality of teachers that we're putting in front of them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I could tell you other stories from being a teacher of how certain teachers get put into certain classrooms because certain parents advocate for certain, would not tolerate that teacher. So we have to get serious about this. And the other thing I would say, and, and it's, a, it's a political dilemma because it's about choices and it's about framing a bigger conversation. We, if we're going to get serious about equity, we have to reframe it um, away from a zero-sum game. Because right now, the way that this is happening at local levels is that uh, people of affluence are saying, wait, 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 wait. If we start helping those kids, my kid's not going to Yale. And what we need to help people realize is that by investing in the infrastructure, everybody's going to benefit. Uh, the, the rising tide will lift all boats in this situation, but it does mean a fundamental rethinking of how we organize schools. Who gets what teachers? What kind of resources? Forget about equal resources. Let's target resources to the schools, to the kids who need them the most. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are just kind of big level. We can have a conversation mm -hmm. afterwards, I promise, because I have a lot of ideas of what this could look like at the classroom <clears throat> level, at the school level, at the district level. James Carr wanted to also jump in as well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I just want to say real quickly that uh, I just reinforce that point. It, it is worth a week. Actually, it's worth several years of conversations. The issues are so complicated, particularly in minority communities, because concentrated poverty creates a new dimension. And so it's not just a matter of fix the school, right? Uh, because the school can be fixed, but what if the parents for example, can't support their children because they don't have the literacy level, for example, to actually read to them at night or actually to do the modern math, right? They, they, it, so it starts there. What if the, the parents don't have the appropriate funds to pay for food that gives them good nutrition or they don't have access to health care, which has been talked about earlier, or the neighborhood itself is unsafe, or the household is living on the edge of poverty, so the school is great, but then they end up moving. What about the teachers who can't find affordable housing anywhere near that school or who don't want to go to that school because even though they're good and they're committed, they know the school isn't supported. So it's a very complex dynamic, and the reality of this country is trying to fix what's broken with the schools without fixing what's broken with our communities is not going to work. And that's why I keep coming back to the point where I truly believe the only way we'll fix this problem is when we are able to make the point in a compelling way, just like national security. It is in the national security interest of this country to fix the problems that were created through decades of discrimination because we, people of color, will be more than half of the U.S. population. We cannot compete. I'll just give you one more statistic, maybe a couple. <laughs> China is a competitor that we didn't have for a whole la that whole last century. 1.3 billion people. We are the 0.3 billion. Well, how about India, another competitor we didn't have to deal with for the last century? 1.2, you add them up, that's 2.5 billion people. We're 0.3. How do we compete against that? They are already eating our lunch. We, okay, James, uh, uh, I'm going to... Come on now, I'm with seconds. you, buddy, come on. 50 seconds. <laughs> 10. We, uh, okay. okay. In, in a book I published last year, <laughs> had a quote that said, we can't afford to stumble into the 21st century. We didn't stumble, we've fallen flat on our faces. We need to make the point that we are critical to the national security and competitiveness of the nation. And when we do that, maybe the resources will be there. If we don't, they will not. Let me just make one additional point, because it does go to the zero f sum frame. There is not anyone in this country that is satisfied with their public school. And that's even though there are many communities whose public schools are significantly more well resourced than the one my eight-year-old daughter and my five-year-old daughter go to, which is our neighborhood public school. We are the only industrialized nation in the world that finances our schools locally. So when James talks about, and, and also Mr. Lemons talk about the, how we finance the schools, 
How we finance them right now is based on a system of racial segregation and concentration of poverty. And the tax base that for, supports those schools are directly built on that. Uh, you, did you have a follow-up? Or, or, yeah. Okay, just, one quick follow-up. Um, do you believe there is a better, also better way to get between the gap of than just saying what could happen if you drop out? Uh, and I'll try to do this quickly. Uh, we, there, we have research-based approaches that have been modeled throughout the United States uh, that have shown that we, with the right kind of pressure and the right kind of supports, every child can make that bridge across. Uh, but it requires rethinking the fundamental assumptions of how we use time, how we use resources, and what's the role of curriculum and what's the role of an adult in the life of a child in a school. And if we're working from the old assumptions, which are fundamentally based upon sorting, then we're just playing on the margins and we're just playing lip service to it. Uh, the problem is that we just haven't been able to go to scale with most of these. They've been boutique-y. Here, an example here, an example here, an example here. 2% here, 1% here. The challenge is how do we go to scale, which requires, I think, a political will that, that, that uh, Mr. Carr is talking about here. We have to get serious about this, and we have to get other people serious about this, and we, ha we have to raise the cacophony of our voices just so loud that people can't ignore us anymore. Thank you. Yeah, um, my question is for the Treasury Department. You had mentioned derivatives earlier. Uh, when I go to the grocery store and I buy the necessities of, of life, bread, cheese, milk, eggs, I pay about 5 or 6 percent sales tax. But on Monday morning, a speculator on Wall Street can buy $100 million worth of derivatives of Exxon stock and not pay one single cent in sales tax. Where does uh, the Treasury Department stand on uh, imposing a tax on these derivatives? Because based on uh, last year's transactions, if you impose a one-tenth of one percent sales tax on derivatives, we could have generated $500 billion with a B. And that way, Wall Street could have bailed out Wall Street. <laughs> I think one of the first things we have to do before we can even talk about putting a tax on derivatives is we have to regulate them to find out who, where they are. So before we even get to your point, which is fair and valid, we don't regulate derivatives transactions in this country at all. We don't know who the counterparties are. We don't know who the contracts are, whether they're customized or standardized. We don't have a clearinghouse. We don't have an exchange. They are completely unregulated. And in many cases, these financial arrangements are ticking time bombs. As you hear about AIG, and you hear about some of these other large financial institutions that everybody calls too big to fail, and we think about some of the derivatives contracts that are at, really at the heart of some of these problems, in our financial regulatory reform legislation, for the first time in the history of this country, we will regulate these transactions. So before we can start to tax them, we have to know where they are and who are the parties engaging in these transactions. So I hear you. The point's made loud and clear. Uh, and if you can help us get this legislation passed, then we can start to talk about taxing those transactions. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Jibala Ojoy. Uh, my question is um, the public uh, health. Um, my question is, is everybody going to be on board? No special preference. With what? Public health. Public health. Oh, public health. No special preference, number one. Then number two, is stop reforming the bill. Top reform for doctors, like, like if doctors have problems, like they've been facing lawsuit. Oh, mal medical malpractice. Oh, okay, so yes. <laughs> are you asking if it's? In, are you I'm asking, just asking if it's in the, the panel. If you're asking yeah. if it's in the legislation, yeah. I think there's some provisions in there. It's the legislation is still being is evolving, but there is discussions around tort. Mm -hmm. What if about? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
So the, as I understood the question, it was one, will there be any reform of, of medical malpractice? Yeah. Um, and the sec the, well, the first part of that was also um, related to whether there would be any special preferences. No, no special preference. Everybody, everybody. including meaning meaning well, every, anybody like who wants to can get access. Meaning including the Congress, including the um, oh. the, um, okay. the yeah. Technically not. There's sort of questions about that. There's no legislation that's been introduced on either the House or the Senate that really gets us to total universal health care. So the answer to that is, is no. Um, but I think it puts us in the right direction in terms of getting there. But it doesn't, every person will not be covered. I mean, so I think that's a fact. And then in terms of the tort issue, there is a provision, I'm pretty certain, I can't recall where, but there is a provision in there that deals with the tort reform. Okay. Is Thank that? You. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and politically, obviously, the debate seems to surround, uh, everyone recognizes it's not a full fix to all the problems in the system, and the question is, how strongly does it put us on the road to what? And depending on what side of the aisle you are on, that road to what is very different. Okay. And part of the reason that they use the term now, you hear people talk about not so much health reform, but health insurance reform, more so than health reform, because it's very specific in terms of the, the market base and wanting to create the, the options mm -hmm. inside of that. But it definitely is, is putting us in the right direction. There's no yeah. question about that. And Gina, can you just elaborate on that a little more? Because I think this is, you're pointing to something I think that is fundamentally misunderstood, which is mm -hmm. the distinction between access to insurance versus access to health care. Meaning there, there, there are studies that show that mm -hmm. the absence of health insurance only explains about 42% Mm -hmm. of African Americans' lack of access to health care, meaning that even if you have health insurance, you're not necessarily getting it. That's correct. Now, that, this has nothing to do with this particular reform legislation. It's what, what do we need to do to ensure access to health care, and what would the next steps be in your view? Mm -hmm. I think that there are provisions that are provided in there in terms of access, um, and I think there's things in terms of what we're going to have to do individually in order to get people to the point of access, um, but I think Right now where the legislation is, in terms of the varying bills that have been done, um, it does not get us to the universal coverage. It, it begins to give us more access by some of the types of programs, be it community health centers. They've talked about the empowerment zones, similar to the empowerment zones at HUD, under HUD. So there's varying programmatic kinds of things that begin to do that. But it's, it's not fully going to get us to where I think we really want to be. But it gets us in the right direction. If we do nothing, it only gets worse. The costs continue to go up, and the 47 or 46 million that people go back and forth with in eight years, it's going to be more like 50 to 60 million people uninsured. So it's not an option not to do anything, but it's not going to get us to the, to the fullest of where we want to be in terms of universal health care. So it deals somewhat with access, it deals somewhat with inequities, it deals with affordability, and it deals with accountability. But it doesn't get us to the full engagement of true universal health care where everyone has access, full access, and there's a lot of things embedded in access, be it transportation, be it you know access to so all sorts of things. So adequate medical care, those sorts of things. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yes, my name is Etzel Batson. I'm from the University of the District, and I just have two questions I want to ask. The first is, what procedures are y'all continuing to put in place to uh, fight against the HIV virus? And two, uh, as far as national security, what are the panels going to take to the president as far as slowing the illegal drugs coming into our nation? Because they're saying that they have levambasol, that is a pig dewormer that they're putting into the coke that's supposed to help progress the AIDS virus. And most of us know it's, it's pretty much focused on the black community or the community of color. So we have two part question. One is what um, the methods are in the, place to right. continue to fight the HIV so virus. So HIV, I don't know that we have anyone working on that specifically. Do we have anyone on the I panel? mean, since you are speaking about universal yeah, health care, there's a major problem yeah. right here yeah. in the city right. of DC. Right, right. 
I mean, right now, I mean, in terms of the Joint Center, I can speak to what we're doing. In terms of HHS, I can't really tell you because there's not been any major things. You know, the Ryan White Act is up for reauthorization. And one of the concerns that we have is that with the funding provision in the Ryan White Act, we're you not just say for a minute, because not everyone may know what the Ryan, what Ryan White These Act is. These are the is. funds that states receive in terms of disbursement of providing services, public services for people with, that have contracted HIV and AIDS. And what's fine, what we're doing now at the Joint Center is we're tracking the dollars, trying to determine once the, you know, the Congress allocates those dollars to the states and then they get to the various health departments, where are those dollars going? No one has been tracking that to see. And that's part of the problem is the resource issue. There's not enough in the prevention aspect of that. There's not enough education that's getting to our communities uh, with regards to that. I think there's a lot of myths about HIV and AIDS today in terms of what people perceive. You know, you don't see the same sort of images that people used to see, so there's this, there's all those sorts of things. But in terms of the health reform legislation, there's no specific provision related to the HIV and AIDS piece at all. It's embedded, I think, in terms of when you deal with issues around access and the various provisions in terms of access in general to health care, certainly those individuals that have contracted HIV and AIDS will be part of that process. But there's no specific provisions. I would, if you're here in D.C., I would talk to the folks at your Department of Health to see what kinds of things they're doing to address address those issues, because that's really where you're going to see at a local level any type of innovations or any type of activities in terms of trying to address the issue, more so than at a federal level. And we also had a national security question. Again, I don't know if there's anyone on the panel who's uh, focused on national security, so we may have to put that to another panel that might be here at the CBCF weekend. But thank you for your, for your question. And we have about 15 minutes left, so these are going to be our final questions and comments. Okay. Um, my name is Sandy Enoch, and um, I kind of have my, that was my daughter who is a, a senior at one of these high schools that you're talking about with all those differences, and she's seeing them firsthand. Mm -hmm. And my question is kind of going off of her. It's like, uh, it sounds like with all the statistics that you showed, that was nothing new. We kind of knew that. And I guess the question is, are we still just talking about this issue? Or are we actually now going to put something in place that we can say in some time frame we're going to see five years, ten years, that we're going to start seeing some differences as opposed to just talking about them? Uh, we've been talking about it for a while. 1983, uh, Nation at Risk Absolutely. came out. And we're still at risk. You know, we're, we're even more at risk. Uh, the challenge in, in scaling up school improvement is that um, the policy can set the parameters, can help to shape the conversation, it can funnel the resources. But what we know from school improvement is that it's what happens at the lowest level that makes the difference. That uh, you can pour resources into a district, but it's about the one school in that district that has that really good, skillful principal, that really good, skillful set of teachers, and it's about those specific classrooms. And scaling up has been our perennial problem for the last 30 years. The most consistent research finding in educational research is that um, reforms don't travel. It's that for every place where something miraculous is going on, uh, nine other places have tried the same thing, and for some reason it didn't play out the same way because of context. Uh, what I will say uh, kind of optimistically is that I think under the, the current administration, and the leadership at the Department of Education, there's some real opportunities. Uh, as, as much as No Child Left Behind has been beaten up, one of the great things that came out of No Child Left Behind was forcing our nation to start paying attention to the achievement of different groups of people in the United States. And schools were allowed to coast just by on the average percentages of performance. And all of a sudden, we had to start paying attention to special education students, African American students, Latino students. And we were starting to be held accountable. There are many opportunities coming about in the, in the next uh, legislative cycle that are going to focus on what's the next level. And one of the, the big pushes is ramping up the quality of content, curriculum, and standards, not just moving kind of minimal standards, but creating world-class standards that enable us to compete internationally. Uh, but we have to be ready to do the other things Correct. also. Yes and not do it on the margins and not try to add superficial band-aids on top of a broken system. 
Mr. Carr. And, and I'll just add to that. You said we've seen a, the statistics all before. Actually, let me throw a little bit of pessimism on it. Uh, we're actually going in the opposite direction pretty significantly. You look at the fact that states all across this country, it's hard to go through the newspapers without seeing how many states are facing all sort manner of deficits. This foreclosure crisis has destroyed house prices, which is real estate, property taxes. So we're actually going in the wrong direction pretty quickly. And the one thing that I would point out is that in November, we voted for change. And then we kind of went home and said, okay, now take care of it, we vote it. And the reality of it is both the president and the Black Caucus need us to be active and motivated and in fr up front and in person and maybe even in the streets if that's necessary to make the point that the policies that we know have to that move forward, there are a lot of people who don't believe it. And so we have to really give support to the people who understand what's necessary and be vocal and be active and not expect that somehow the, you know, an, an election means that we can go home now and wait for the president to do it or wait for the Black Caucus to do it. We have to find ways to help them because we're actually moving in the wrong direction and we're moving pretty quickly. And just real quick, um, Mr. U.S. Treasurer, you said that, you, that you've that already put things in place for... Congratulations. I'm here temporarily. <laughs> we expect those sales taxes now exactly. that you've been promoted. I'll let Geithner know. <laughs> you said that there's already been uh, regulation passed on some of the credit cards. and, and yes. the, can, is there some place I can go specifically to read upon this that you can tell me specifically? Absolutely. There's a website called www.financialstability.gov, and it will talk about all these things. Thank uh, you. We don't get enough publicity from it. .gov, financialstability.gov. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, you can also I, go to the Treasury Department website, talk about it as well. Uh, Yes, my name is uh, Quincy, and I, I just wanted to, uh, I noticed that you mentioned that community banks is a good source for, you know, people to go to. I also wanted to note the credit unions as well. Uh, nobody had mentioned the credit unions, um, but I've been a lifelong member of the, <laughs> I've been a lifelong member of the credit unions, and uh, I found that, and I'm a member of a bank too, and I found that the credit unions often do me a lot better in terms of the race and in terms of the access and yep. in terms of the way that I'm treated uh, when I go through the door. But uh, the, question that, the question that I have has to do with financial literacy because I haven't heard a lot about that on this panel. And when yeah, it comes yeah, to yeah. building wealth in the African-American community, I find that to be the most important thing. Um, I know that uh, as a young child, I, I didn't know a lot about uh, financial literacy because my mom worked really, really hard. That was actually her up here. She worked really, really hard, single, to provide for me and my sister. And, um, and so there wasn't a lot of time to educate me about that. And wasn't always in, uh, and in the schools. You can't depend on them to educate people about that. So I just want to know what you guys felt that uh, we could do uh, to help raise the level of financial literacy among the African-American community. Because uh, there was a sister up here that said 50% of the subprime loans that were given out uh, didn't need to be people qualified for them. They didn't get them because they wanted to them. They got them because they didn't know any better. No, they and got so, them actually because in a lot of instances there weren't other institutions willing to make prime rate loans to them. So I think your point is critically important. We do need financial literacy, but I think we have to understand how structural the problem is. But let me also let other speak to that because I think we need both. We need structural reform as well as financial literacy, but yes. Sure. I'll, I see Dr. Um, spoken. Yeah, yeah, I think that financial literacy is important, but I would actually add another thing that I've been uh, thinking about and pushing la lately, uh, labor market literacy. Um, some people, you know, I, I used to, to teach and all, um, the sort of minority students from working class backgrounds would come and would say, I'm interested in criminal justice. You know, I want to do work in corrections. But the white middle class students that uh, never raised that as a career option. You know, they might be interested in becoming a criminal criminologist and study from a social science per perspective, but they were never interested in criminal justice as a career. And I think that we really need to open up the labor market to everyone so that people really think about a whole range of jobs and not simply think of, well, I'm going to do what, you know, what I see around me. You know, it's, it's a broader world. So we need financial liter literacy. We need labor market literacy. 
Um, but we also need regulation because, you know, as, as people have mentioned, these, these uh, instruments and the fine print can be very complicated. So we, we definitely need the government behind us sort of regulating, making sure that we, we have a chance uh, because, you know, most people only buy a house once or twice. You know, the, the, pers the realtor is selling houses every day, you know, so really there is an imbalance of knowledge and experience. Um, and we need a regulator to make sure to level that playing field. Well, can I, 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 I just want to address your question real quick, and I want to say yes. I want to echo what he said and say, look, we're going to get it on one end, in which we're going to create regulation that's going to stop people from being preyed upon by some of these financial intermediaries. So that's one thing we're going to do. So we'll solve the structural problems. And second, we are going to do something about financial literacy. Uh, there's some legislation that's going to come out very soon. Uh, there's some programs that we're going to announce in the Treasury Department. Uh, please look on our website, be aware, but we will be doing some things about financial literacy because it doesn't work if we don't do one without the other. So, Just, just to ask you to expound a little bit on your answer, like you, you had mentioned that regulation, we need more regulation. Well, I know that at Bank of America right now, they have a division of lawyers that are trained to find their way around regulation. So whatever regulation you come up with, they're going to find a way to put another product out there. So I was just wondering, aside from regulation. Well, they're going to have to hire a whole bunch more lawyers <laughs> uh, in about I, a year. I hear a boost to the economy. I believe, I believe they'll do it. Look, let me tell you something. I don't think they're going to leave the dollars. Businesses the are always going to try to do what they can in ways to increase profit and that's just the American way and that's our capitalist system but we can't stand by and let what took place in the fall happen again and the president is not going to let happen on his watch people get preyed upon by these financial intermediaries that were not regulated before he's just not going to let it happen I promise you this if the man has to go to the grave this is one of the things he cares about most Ooh. deeply I don't know if you've ever heard him talk about his own experiences with credit cards I mean, he really feels this stuff, and we all do. And mm -hmm. we're here, we're fighting every single day, and we need your help because the forces of the status quo are extraordinarily powerful. There is no more extraordinary, the only powerful, more powerful lobby than the health insurance and pharmaceutical industry is the financial services industry. Okay. And they've been preying on all of us for years, and yep. so it's time to stop. It's absolutely true. So, James, you wanted to get in here on this, and we have two Just more questions. Just very quickly, to and, I, and I think it's important to recognize that once something, as I said before, leaves the White House and goes to Congress, you have to stay on it. Already, as Stella Alexander pointed out, they've taken out the plain vanilla requirement. Yeah. This is, goes to the heart of your question. Why did so many people get subprime? Because they weren't told about or they weren't offered the prime loan. And already that law, as good as it was from the president, has been diminished by taking out the requirement that they offer the plain vanilla first. It doesn't, the fact that you offer plain vanilla doesn't say we can't give you a more innovative product, but it does say, do you want the standard upon which wealth has been created in housing for 70 years? And now you don't have to. So it's important what the president is doing, but just to echo this side of the table, we need to make sure that when it leaves the president's office and goes to Congress, we stick with it and we help those people who want to get these things enacted because if we don't, it won't happen. Thank you. Hello, um, I'll make it quick. Um, I know the school curriculum is very tight, but is there any legislation about putting financial literacy in the schools so we can stop the problem before it happens? Anyone? I don't know. Uh, well, in terms of the the, the common standards that that are being developed right now, which is by, from coalitions and groups working across states, I, I don't know of anything. Uh, I know that there are states and districts that have begun to take this on. Uh, there's also legislation that's being worked on right now uh, that is focused at higher ed that's putting into this legislation that's going to stabilize funding from the feds to students trying to receive higher education uh, a big component on financial literacy because what we're finding is that, that students are trying to find ways to fund this education because they know it's, it's the way into a whole different life uh, they don't know how to navigate the system. They don't know how to, to apply for the, the, the loans. They don't know how to get the right rate. And what if you don't uh, uh, qualify for enough? Where do you go for that mm -hmm. extra mm -hmm. loan money? And th there's a, a big component in new legislation that's being worked on that's about 
pushing services towards students so that they're making wise uh, and effective choices that will benefit them 30, 40 years down the road when they're still paying off these college loans that the rest of us are still paying off. Okay, yes, James has a one minute intervention. Less than one, 30 seconds. I think it's something we ought to insist on. In a country that, you know, capitalist market, not teaching financial education starting off from grade one makes no sense at all. And during the 1990s, there were a number of programs that went beyond just basic financial education that went into things like entrepreneurship, teaching kids how to, you know, investment clubs and things of that nature. I think we ought to make that a very, very high priority and really stay with it. Thank you. Yes, our last question. Okay, well, it's kind of a two-parter. What do you guys feel about the advisors that are telling people to short sell their homes and how it's not necessarily going to impact their credit? Um, and also, what do you think that's going to do to our econ economy like two years from now, three years from now, or even their ability to actually get financing later? Um, I have friends who are doing that because their homes are down by maybe $100,000, but to me, to ruin your credit doesn't seem like the best thing. And unfortunately, none of us qualify for any of the programs that are out there. You mean the loan modifications? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, look, <laughs> it's an awful, awful situation. The number of foreclosures that are taking place in this country uh, because of either unemployment or people were put into bad mortgages uh, is horrific. Uh, we tried to do the Making Home Affordable program, so what we've tried to do is basically force servicers uh, through by paying them, basically, because they don't do anything without making money, and that's what drives them, mm -hmm. to modify loans. And so our program so far, we think we've got roughly about 85% of the loans covered in this country under the sort of the servicers, under the loan modification options. Uh, the problem you're talking about is one that we're still working on. Uh, we're well aware of it, and there's a number of people in Congress who have different pieces of legislation out there that are either aimed at doing things uh, trying to help people find a soft landing. So if it's a situation where you know that you just can't pay the note, uh, trying to find a rental, uh, trying to do a number of different things, because uh, the financial pain that people are going through right now, uh, in some cases, is going to change lives uh, and harm families uh, in ways that can't even be really calculated. Um, well, a lot of these people are people who can afford the note, but they're telling them, why throw you know good money after bad? You'll never get that $100,000. I wouldn't take that <laughs> advice. Well, I, I mean, mean, I, um, you know, I, I think don't, they're crazy, I, you know, but... But look, you, you got to also realize, okay. though, in economic times, again, people see pigeons that are waiting to be fleeced. So all these ads you hear on TV about, we'll help you get out of your loan, we'll help you restructure your mortgage, it's the U.S. government. Don't believe any of that stuff. We're going to continue to prosecute them. The Justice Department has started to prosecute some of these companies, and we're going to continue to do it because, again, all they're doing is looking for opportunities to make money off of people's ignorance, their fear, uh, and then not being educated about their rights. So don't do it. Oh, I'm James. Yeah, yeah just, just very quickly. So as soon as predatory loan lending went out, right, mm -hmm. predatory mortgage rescues came in. And so yeah. one of the newest, hottest businesses is loan modification scams. And so for a person who's thinking about and they, they, they feel they may be at risk, they should contact a HUD certified counselor, a nonprofit counseling organization. One of the things you should know is that if that counselor starts telling you that you have to pay, hang that phone up and run like your hair was on fire because <laughs> the federal government is paying for loan counselors and they are available in every state across this country. So there is no generic answer. It's talk to a loan counselor and find out exactly what your circumstances are. In many cases, a short sell is actually a very beneficial way to exit because you don't end up with debt. So better to have a bad credit score than to end up with a bad credit score and owing fifty to dollars to $100,000 in debt. But if people are encouraging you to do it, it may be scamming. So go with a counselor who knows and will get all of your financial information and all the information about your home and give you a professional, qualified uh, response. And then ultimately, you may end up going to the Making Home Affordable program that is being supported by the administration and a number of large servicers. Or you may not do any of that. You may just stay and continue to pay on your home. But don't just take the advice of someone who you don't know who's telling you, leave that house. And you can reach James Carr at <laughs> 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 uh, Yes, yes. But the, I think I want to thank the panel because it's been both rich and informative.
provocative. And we, we've, we really heard an overarching message from everyone, which is as bad as things are, there are actually a lot of opportunities if we get active, engaged, pay attention to what's happening, recognize that we do have both experts, allies outside of government, within government, um, actual cycles of policy discussions that are happening right now that we should be engaged in and understanding and in discussing with our elected officials. So I'm running a 501c3 organization, so I'm not going to tell you what those are, but you heard them here. Um, and uh, so the bottom line is we actually can do something. That's what we heard. We, there are solutions. There are things we can do. We need to do them together. We need to do them actively, and we need to recognize our resources to do that. So thank you, panel, for being a resource. Jackie Bird, she was the one who gave me the bone marrow transplant. Save a life while you can in your lifetime.